Good morning and welcome to Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile House, BC, Canada. My name is Pastor Clint Lang. It is Sunday morning, April the 25th, 2021. Glad to have you join us today for our Sunday morning service. For all of you who are following for the first time or from the outside of our congregation, welcome. We're glad that you could join us here online. And for those of you who are part of our congregation, just a reminder, um, the first week of May, we're going to be starting our services in the field behind the church with our drive-in uh, service. So just invite a friend. Uh, it's going to be great to see each other there, and uh, we can look forward to that. Now, in the midst of all of what we're going through, uh, it's just really good to be able to, to bring the Word of God to you online. And uh, I'm just glad for the technology that we can do this. Would you bow with me today as uh, we begin our service? Heavenly Father, I'm just so grateful for each person that's following this message today. I pray, God, that you would lead me to speak the truth of your word, Father, in the way that you had intended. And God, that people out there, their hearts would be moved towards you. And Father, that they'd be encouraged and strengthened in their faith. And for those that maybe are out there that don't know you, I pray, God, that they would know how much you love them and how you desire them to become your children and, and how you've made the provisions to do that. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week we uh, left off in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. For those of you who are new to our broadcast, we're uh, entering into a sermon series in the book of 2 Corinthians, and we've had a, 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 several messages up to this point, but we're going to continue this morning uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Last week I preached about a scenario where Paul was talking to the Corinthians about his suffering because of his, his being true to the call of God on him and how there, there, there was all kinds of times where he even... Uh, despaired of life itself just because of the pressures that were on him and the physical um, persecution that he was enduring. Now, he spoke to them as well last week, we spoke about this, about restoring a brother who had fallen into a sinful lifestyle and they, they had to discipline him in Corinth and he was put out of their fellowship for a season and then they invited him back. And I shared with you about church discipline last week at length. So today we're going to be moving on to the second half of 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And my text this morning is 12 to 17 in a message that I have entitled The Fragrance of the Presence of God. So at the conclusion of our message today, we're going to be partaking in communion together. And if you're a believer in Jesus, whether you're a regular attender of Hillside Community Church or not, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior, you're welcome to join us in this uh, communion celebration at the end of my message today. So it might be uh, time, a good time to pause this video and go and get your communion elements ready and be ready to partake of communion at the end of today's message. So that being said, would you please turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 2, starting with verses 12 and 13. Paul writes, Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. The Apostle Paul was a a great believer in going through the doors and ministering where God would open them. And he'd experienced this supernaturally uh, in his ministry in the past. And he recognized that God had opened a door for him into Troas to preach the gospel. And, you know, Paul's purpose was to plant churches, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ that would set people free. And he, he did this with great joy. Paul would find people uh, sunk in despair, filled with darkness, lives governed by superstition and fear, being hounded and haunted and hurt by all they were going through. Um, without even realizing what they were going through, the people uh, would listen to Paul's messages and their spiritual eyes would be opened and they would be saved and set free from all the things that uh, were destroying them. And uh, Paul's joy 
and passion was to come with this good news of the gospel uh, to tell these people about their creator and how he understood those hurts that they were going through, the darkness they had been living in. He came to preach to them that Jesus Christ had come in power to touch human lives, to deliver them from their darkness, to heal their hurts, and to bring them freedom in living how God intended them to live. So he learned that God was leading him and the door opened for him to go to, to Troas. But interesting, I find, uh, it's really interesting in this passage that Paul, even though he recognized this open door, he still had a humanness about him where he struggled. Um, he had human feelings to contend with. And Paul came into this community, yet he tells us here that he was unable to take advantage of his circumstances there because his heart was so troubled, his spirit so anxious for news of really what was happening in Corinth because he had sent, um, he had sent Titus to Corinth and, and Titus wasn't there. I guess they must have uh, made an arrangement to see that Titus was there, but he wasn't there. And this troubled Paul's heart. And Paul actually was so troubled by this, he went and left looking for Titus. Possibly Titus went to Macedonia. I think uh, as he was waiting, that perhaps he was thinking all of his labors in Corinth may be in danger of falling apart. And, you know, as human as he is, he's going to be concerned about that. And, and it must have gripped him. Um, you know, maybe possibly he struggled with the sense of, well, maybe he didn't do everything he could in Corinth to settle things there. Um, maybe there was a feeling of failure uh, that he was struggling with. In the letters he, he wrote to, to the Corinthians, we see be, before this passage that we're reading here in, in 2 Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians, Paul had to deal with a whole host of different things in the Corinthian church and and it wasn't always all accepted with great joy by the people um, you know there was things eating at the uh, the life of this church and threatening to undo all the work that he'd done and in the midst of this sense of pressure and angst angst I guess you could say he had been given this great opportunity uh, but he couldn't lay hold of it. Um, he left Troas and he went to Macedonia, hoping to find his brother Titus there to find some relief for his troubled mind. And I, I'm sure that Paul was looking forward to spending time with Titus, but more than that, Paul recognized, I think, the need that he had for Titus uh, to help him. And because Titus wasn't there, Paul didn't have peace of mind in his time in Troas. And, and because of that, the time was short. You know, I, I think Paul was, um, you know, he was a powerful apostle for Christ, but he realized that he couldn't do the whole job there alone. Um, he was not just a one-man show. I, I, I don't think that most people understand the incredible pressure that was on the apostle at this time of his writing. Um, he had laid everything on the line for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of the Corinthians. He'd suffered for his stand incredibly for the gospel to the point where, you know, we see in the last message that I had that he even despaired of life itself. Um, so he continues in his letter to the Corinthians here. And uh, this is kind of the introduction, you know. And now he says in verse 14, But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession, and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. God saw the things that Paul and the other apostles and those who were helping them had done for the sake of the gospel and how much they had suffered in their both, both in their physical and their emotional being for the name of Jesus. And, and, you know, in this, I think God saw their heart. They, God saw Paul's heart was good and was right. 
And he purposed for Paul and the others uh, who are partnered with him to live their lives as a sacrifice for him, even as he lived as a sacrifice for them. In John chapter 12, verses 24 to 26, Jesus tells us this, Verily, truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant must also follow. My Father will honor the one who serves me. So, with that in mind, the analogy that Paul is using, that he and the others who are being led around in procession were, Christ, were part of Christ's uh, triumphant procession throughout the world, it, it brings with it a, a victory, a, an image of a victory parade and the spoils of war. Now, spiritually speaking, the Apostle Paul was in the process, he was in the process of laying down his life in service to Jesus. Jesus Christ, his general and king, who had laid down his own life for Paul, uh, made Paul realize that he called him to follow him in his footsteps. And, you know, he knew what his Lord said in Matthew chapter 15, 24 to 27, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. So Paul, he recognized his need to die to self. So having died to self, Paul suggests that there was victory. And I mean, that's not normal in, uh, in regular life, right? When you die, you're not able to continue. But when you die to yourself for the sake of Christ, you find life. Because the gospel was able to flourish through his death to self and the death of the other disciples of Jesus to themselves. You know, in the Roman times when there was a victory in battle, the conquering armies, they, they, would, uh, they would parade through the city streets. So the general would ride through the streets in front of the procession in a chariot, and then would come the generals of his army, the, the celebration, the standards would be brought out, the captains and the commanders of his forces. The streets would be filled with people shouting acclamations of the victory. And th this is the picture that Paul has in mind. He sees Christ marching in triumph throughout the world and himself um, in that conquering train. Now, Having died to himself, he had been made part of this triumphant army of the light brigade of Jesus Christ. Now, commentary Barclay says, it's, uh, uh, commentator Barclay says, it's a triumph which Paul is certain nothing can stop. And, and Paul sees himself in sharing in the triumph of Jesus, the captain of the Lord's army. And, and Paul is one of the Lord's chief officers. And this triumphant procession spreads the knowledge of Christ through the crowds of people like fragrance of incense in the victory procession. When they went into the city in this procession, there would be people carrying incense along with the, the celebratory uh, entrance of this army back into the city. And uh, this is the picture that Paul's painting here. Paul says this fragrance is pleasing to God. And, and it's the knowledge of Christ that is spread throughout the crowds of people in the world like this fragrance. And, and God was pleased with this aroma. He was pleased with them for taking the gospel to the Gentile world, including the Corinthians who are being addressed in this letter. Now, the knowledge of Christ being spread into uh, crowds of people will bring two reactions. Um, to those who will not accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, uh, the knowledge of Christ, which tells people to die to themselves, 
That is not a popular message. It's repugnant, re repugnant. and it, it, it actually smells like death if you equate it to an aroma to them. Um, in their estimation, um, the gospel is a restriction on their personal freedoms and as such it cannot be good because it tells them that they must humble themselves and die to themselves. And they're unwilling to, to bend to that. And it, it seems to them like something bad. But to those who hear the message and yield to it, the Holy Spirit opens their eyes to the truth and the message becomes the pleasing aroma of life. For they understand the words of Jesus that we've read this morning, uh, that true life is found not in, uh, in saving your own life and living for yourself. True life is found in the denial of the sin nature that we're all born with and being clothed in the white robe of righteousness of God in Christ. In verse 16, Paul continues, To the one we are an aroma that brings death, to the other an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. So Paul here is expressing to the Corinthians that he was pleased to suffer the loss of his own carnal life. And have it exchanged for the sweetness of knowing Jesus and being part of this victory procession that he finds himself in. And he desires to be pleasing to God. And he's carried his ministry out for the other's benefit, just as Christ carried out his ministry for the benefit of all of us. With sincerity, Paul was serving his king and was laying himself down for his king. And he mentions this. With every victory won, you see, there is a corresponding battle. This is a picture of a victory that is won. That Paul's saying that even though he's had all this trouble and all this suffering and everything, he's got victory because the life of Christ has become life within him. It's put the old man down. And uh, when you become born again as a Christian, a true Christian, the Spirit brings life to your spirit and you're now at one with God. You are made at one with Him. You're justified, made just as if you had never sinned. And you become to become like Jesus, sanctified, changed, uh, and conformed to the image of Christ. And this is a sweet aroma. This is a sweet thing to God when He looks at that. He's pleased. And to others that uh, are, are looking and are, whose hearts are looking for answers, they'll look at us and they'll say, what, you, what do you have that I don't have? There's something about you. I've had this happen to me where someone has come up to me and say, said, you know, there's just something about you. Why? What do you have that I don't have? Well, maybe you've experienced the same thing. It's this aroma in the spirit of Christ. And I've also had people uh, come up to me who instantly hate me. And they can't understand why they hate me. They just hate me. And this is a spiritual clash. You see, there is a battle going on for the souls of mankind. And the heat of the battle sometimes, as a matter of fact, most of the times the heat of the battle is not a pleasant place. You see, our, our true enemy that we fight against is not human. It is principalities and powers of darkness whose religion whose religion is selfishness. And if they can get human beings to buy into their religion, it's selfishness. And selfishness resists um, humbling oneself before God uh, and, and, and serving other people and serving God, laying down our own interests for the interests of others. That's not the natural way. And the powers of darkness want to try and reinforce uh, in people that, no, you just got to think about yourself. It's all about you. And the scriptures make it abundantly clear that when we fight, that in the midst of the battle, there's going to be suffering. Suffering is going to accompany the battle. My friends, if you're in the midst of a battle, you are going to suffer. It can be most unpleasant when we're in the midst of it. 
Sometimes we say, why do I have to go through this? But our master, Jesus Christ, went through it. Paul the apostle, all the apostles went through it. It's part of being a, a Christian. A true Christian is going to suffer. And there's many times that we feel as though we don't have the strength to carry on. And we cry out on the Lord. We feel like we're going to be overrun. And the good news is this. That God gives us grace and grace upon grace. And peace and peace upon peace to make it through it. Not just to make it through it, but to triumph through it. And God has given us his armor and has promised, promised us victory as his marching orders. This triumphant procession is assured. No weapon formed against us shall prosper. When, when we're sent into the world, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Christ, the true church of Christ. When we yield to the Spirit, there is great victory. Paul's words to the Corinthians are, are loaded with symbolic images of this. And in my time of pastoring, I, I remember once that I had to deal with a very difficult funeral ceremony. And I guess you could say that there were some there at that funeral ceremony that were part of the group, inner group, that did not believe in Christ. And they wanted a religious ceremony, all right, but they didn't want the presentation of the gospel. And to me, I looked at it, as I do all funerals, as an opportunity to share with people who are contemplating their lives in that moment. I want to share with them the freedom and the new life that is available and the hope that there is in serving Christ, both here and now and for everlasting life. But the convicting words of the gospel scripture do not make some people happy. As a matter of fact, it can make them angry. And I recall as I'm doing this funeral and I'm speaking the gospel that I can see the expressions on some of their faces. And they sta stand there and stare s after the service, sullen and angry. And uh, you can just see it through their eyes as the gospel is being presented. Now, to them, to those people maybe that seemed as though I was speaking the fragrance of death to them because I was encouraging surrender of self to Jesus. But you see, they weren't the only ones there. There are many others who heard the message, and you could tell by the way their faces were, by the tears in their eyes. It was like a refreshing, fragrant hope to them, life to them. And they were inwardly yearning to hear more of the, the message of hope and freedom that's available through surrendering to the message of Christ. And, and this is the blank, stark reality of what Paul was saying to the Corinthian church here at this point. Um, wherever Paul went, uh, people were either helped on to freedom and life in Christ, or they were angered. And their opposition against the message of the gospel was hardened, and they were driven further towards death. Paul made an impact wherever he went in this procession. There was no place that he went where there was not an impact. Either people were accepting the message of freedom through Christ, or they were resenting it and rejecting it and being angered by it. And Paul faced the wrath of those who were angered by it. He also received the blessing of those who were, who were supporting it. But the apostle assures the people that the message he was bringing was not for any other reason but for the fact that he desired to be pleasing to God. He desired to obey the marching orders of his general who led the procession. There was no ulterior motives. Unlike some people who might use the gospel as a way to, to get rich 
Uh, Paul was not interested in this. He had faithfully brought this message to them out of obedience. You know, it, it comes to mind uh, that this marching order that Paul had been given, um, he, it was promised that it would not be an easy one and that he would suffer uh, incredibly for the stands that he would take. You know, when you look back, on Paul's calling into ministry right after he was met by Jesus on the road to Damascus. He was blinded and then he was sent into Damascus and a man named Ananias was asked to pray for him. Um, Ananias was questioning the Lord about this and uh, in Acts 6 19 Paul said or uh, uh, Jesus said this to Ananias when he was telling Ananias to pray for Paul. He said this, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Well, Jesus Christ is called the suffering servant. His apostles walked in the same footsteps as suffering servants of Christ. Was it worth it? Absolutely it was. There's victory through dying to self. The seed that falls into the ground reproduces. And I can say it's the same thing all the way through the centuries. The harder pressed the church is, the more persecution that comes to the church, the more people come to Christ because people make the decision to die to self and give everything that they have and everything that they are to the Lord in service to him. This is a pleasing fragrance to God, a pleasing aroma to those that are out there that are searching for answers. If you don't die to self, you will not be a pleasing aroma of spiritual life to those who are walking in darkness that are searching. Yes, you're also not going to be a catalyst that's going to cause people to be angry with you either. You're going to be neutral lukewarm and the bible has a lot to say about the lukewarm church my friends it's time for us to take this seriously to understand god take my life if it means suffering if it means um going beyond myself that's what i want i want to die to myself to bring you glory so that that there will be a flourishing in the kingdom of God through my life. Make my life a pleasing aroma to you, O God. Make my life something that, that says, what's so different about you than everybody else? There's something that you have that I don't have. You see, when you are a, a true child of God, everlasting life pours through you. Everlasting life comes out of your eyes. They see the difference. So what can we as a church take away as a lesson from this passage? The gospel is the light of the world. And Paul preached the salvation message of Christ wherever he went because he knew it was the power of God. Paul once wrote in Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. Paul sent or God sent Paul to plant the church in Corinth. And like the Corinthians, we have been established here as a Gentile church in 100 Mile or wherever you are, as a beacon of God's light into this present darkness. We're part of the same procession of victory in Christ, following our great general and king in the same manner as Paul, Titus, and the others of that day who followed Jesus. Paul was a man just like us. He was subject to discouragement. He was subject to being anxious about stuff. And he understood that he couldn't do it alone. God opens doors for us. And, and, and God has opened doors for you. And he's also put people alongside of you to work with you. Like Paul put, uh, God put Paul and Titus together. God has people that, want, that he wants you to work alongside with. And Jesus calls us collectively to work side by side and to service for him today. Service for the kingdom. A church is made up of many members and each person is, is important to the overall 
health and functioning of that church. And there's going to be times where we will have to face difficult things, to say difficult things, to stand on difficult principles, things that this world considers to be foolishness or things that some people in this world might get angry about. But the gospel of Christ tells us that to follow Jesus, we must deny ourselves, first of all, pick up our crosses and follow him in that triumphant procession. When we share in the gospel with the people of our community, with our neighbors, relatives, co-workers, and others that we rub shoulders with, many people are going to see the light of God's kingdom through us. It's true, many are going to be angered because many do not want to deny themselves. They want to live for themselves. As a matter of fact, there's probably more of those than want that are looking for change. They're happy in their sin. They want to live in their sin. That's going to happen. And those people are going to maybe resist or resent you as the fragrance of Christ, the gospel of Christ. Our, our message is definitely going to cause some recoiling. And we're going to be looked at as death. But along with that, as we pour our lives out for others selflessly, there's going to be some that will see us and, and they'll say, I want what you have. And we'll be able to lead them to, to Jesus. And God has planned it so that we go out and we, we take this gospel message into our workplaces, in amongst our family, into our neighborhoods, amongst our friends. And just as they rejected Christ and they persecuted Christ and Christ suffered, we should expect no less. We should be pleased actually when we encounter suffering because we know we're following in the footsteps of our masters as it's written in Romans chapter 8, 17. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So brothers and sisters, don't be discouraged when you're out there. When we find ourselves in the battle against our ancient foe, there's going to be suffering in the midst of the battle. It's just the way it is while we are in this tent of a body. While we are here, we are going to have trials. But don't be afraid. Be encouraged. The principalities and powers of this world, they stand in the fray against us, but God has given us overcoming power. The Lord has promised us victory in the end. And most importantly, along with the victory that is ours in Jesus, I would encourage you today, <laughs> there is great reward in following Christ. It starts here and now, but the eternal re reward that's awaiting for us outweighs all of the, the troubles that we face here for standing up for Jesus. <laughs> it says this in the scriptures, but as it is written, I has not seen nor has the ear heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And that is our blessed hope. Amen. Now this Sunday, we will be celebrating communion together. And this communion service that we're going to be entering into is for believers. And if you're not a believer in Jesus, the ceremony is not for you. But you can partake in this ceremony if you come to surrender your life to Jesus Christ and believe in him and confess with your mouth that he is Lord, then you can participate in this ceremony. And in recognition of of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, of his broken body and his shed blood, it's, it's important for us at this moment to realize that this is a very holy time. It's a time 
where we ought to examine ourselves. And if we have anything against anyone, any grudges, or maybe we're holding on to other sins we've allowed ourselves to slip into, that before we take communion and honor and remembrance of Jesus and all that he's done for us, that we acknowledge our frailty before God and ask for his forgiveness and, and his help for us to overcome. <coughs> so let us take a few moments today to bow in silence before Jesus. Thank you, Lord. It was written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23, starting with verses 23 onward. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you who are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So it's really important today that we examine our hearts and that we recognize that communion is identifying ourselves with the broken body and the spilled blood of the Lord for our sins. You see, when Jesus hung on the cross. Before he went to the cross, they beat him. They beat his body and they beat a crown of thorns around his head. They, um, they mocked him. They spat on him. They did all these terrible things to our Savior. And by his stripes, it says, we are healed in Isaiah. Jesus took the stripes for our spiritual healing. So that if we believe in Jesus and we turn to him and we, we look to him as our savior and we ask him to forgive us of our sins, by his stripes, we are healed and we're brought into oneness with God. This is something we remember, saints of God. We remember what Jesus did for us in allowing them to break his body. Jesus, we thank you for your broken body. We thank you for allowing yourself, the King of the universe, to be humbled unto death on the cross. Thank you for allowing them to, to, to beat you on our behalf, Lord, so that we could be set free. For Lord, we, re we really deserve that beating. Your body was broken for us. Your stripes were taken on your back for our sin. And we thank you, Lord, that we have received healing in your name because of those stripes. Thank you, Lord, for subjecting yourself 
to this cruel treatment for us. You allowed them to, to force you to carry your cross. You allowed them to pound the spikes through your feet and through your wrists and to lift you up. And the scriptures tell us that if you be lifted high above the earth, that you would draw all men unto yourself. So, Lord, you were lifted up on that day when you died for our sins. And you draw all men unto yourself, Lord, because of that. And today, Lord, we stand here amazed at your grace. It is amazing grace, Lord. How sweet it is. Jesus, we remember you. We remember your broken body. If there's anything in between us and you, Lord, or us and anyone else, God, we lay that aside now and we ask you would just cleanse us, forgive us, strengthen us, renew us, oh God. And we thank you for the covering in your holy name and the robe of righteousness that you lay across our shoulders because of your work on the cross, because of your grace. And we partake now of this bread in remembrance of you. Would you partake with me in remembrance of Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin because the penalty of sin is death. And Jesus, the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb of God, shed his blood for our sake so that our blood would not have to be shed. He was the Lamb of God, the sacrificial Lamb of God. And His blood paid for the sins of anyone who would place their trust in Him. And today, we acknowledge, Jesus, that You shed Your blood for us. We thank You, Jesus, that Your blood flowed down the cross and onto the dirt. That when they beat You, Lord, blood flowed from Your veins, O God and spilled for us. And we know that life is in the blood and that your blood was poured out unto death for us. And the sins of the world were placed upon your shoulders. But you so loved the world, Lord, that you gave, you gave your son. Jesus, you came, God in the flesh, you came to save us from our sins and to sacrifice yourself for us. That whoever believes in you their sin would be atoned for, and they would be granted everlasting life. Thank you, Jesus, for your blood that cleanses us, for your blood that gives us life. Thank you, Jesus, for your death on the cross. We remember you today as we drink of the cup. Jesus, we remember you for all that you are and all that you have done. You are our general, our king, our God, and our savior. And we honor you today in remembrance of Jesus, let us drink. Thank you, Lord. Amen. May God's grace and may his peace rest on you and your household today. I pray that today would be a day that you'd, you just look at your life and that you would see all that God has given you and all that he's done and that your heart would be filled with gratitude to your Savior today and that you would resolve to live for him in obedience to his call to be the church that he's called you to be to be the people he's called you to be you're gonna suffer sometimes but you're also going to partake in the glory of God when you see people come to know him and everlasting glory in heaven is your reward. God bless you. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon.